up, Bloom Church? Man, it is so incredibly exciting to be with you today. First off, if you're new, let me introduce myself. My name is Mike. I have the wonderful honor of being the lead pastor. But more importantly, I am incredibly honored that you chose to spend your Sunday with us. You could be anywhere. The fact that you're here means the absolute world to us. We hope you feel loved and honored today. All right, guys, we're in the middle of a series right now called The Year of the Bible. And what we've done as a church is we've made this commitment. We're going to read through the entirety of the Bible together. And every week, what we're going to do is we're going to take something out of our reading text and dive a little bit deeper. Our sermons are going to center around what we read today. And if you're new here or maybe you didn't get plugged in, you go, man, that sounds cool. Like, I wish I would have gotten a part of that. I wish I would have gotten the reading. Well, guess what? You still can. Every single month, we print off bookmarks that has every single day listed with the reading plan attached. We got May out there, and we just got June fresh off the presses. So go right out to the Welcome Center, the Black Tent, any of these exits, you can grab one, and then just find today's date and start, and next week you will be fully caught up, and we can finish the year together strong. How powerful is that? Reading the Word and growing together as a community. I'm really excited to share the message today with you guys because I feel like it's something that is really difficult to speak on. We don't always like it, but it is something that is so a part of who we are called to be as disciples. I don't know about you, but I got this little thing about me sometimes. It's called my selfish nature. I don't know. I can get selfish at times. I know right now some of you are like, no, Pastor Mike, you like a, that's not, can't happen. You, you are Pastor Mike. You can't be selfish. I know that's appalling to some of you, but I have a selfish side that I got to fight. Sometimes I don't want to answer the phone. Sometimes I don't want to deal with another problem. Sometimes I just don't feel like it, right? Sometimes I want life to be about me. There's this selfish nature that I am constantly battling and fighting. I don't know if you've ever dealt with it, but I do. I don't know if you've ever had these thoughts. Maybe you don't act on them, right? We don't always act on our selfish thoughts. We don't ever voice them. But how many people, like, it was like, it would be awesome when you get sick, man. When you get sick, somebody just comes and serves you, right? They put a nice little cold rag on your head. They got the essential oils with the nebulizer just filling the room. They talk to you with that sympathetic voice. They bring you some chicken noodle soup. And I don't mean that canned chicken noodle juice. I mean that good stuff that heals your body and your soul, right? They're always asking, how can I help you? You get to lay in bed and, and just watch whatever you want. How many of you like when you're sick, like that's what you, like that would be awesome, right? But those same people that think that how many people times whenever people get sick, you're like, just suck it up, right? You're like, get over it. We got things to do. Like when other people are sick, you're like, nah, right? This is a battle me and my wife have, right? I'm sympathetic to her, but she not to me, right? Don't, don't tell her I said that. Don't tell her I said that. I'm going to get in trouble, right? But here's the reality. We might not always voice our selfishness. We might not come out and say it, but we feel it at times, right? Sometimes we are battling it. Jesus said daily you got to take up your cross and die to yourself. Every single day we're battling these emotions of trying for life to be all about us and letting our selfish nature ride above what God has called and created us to be. But here's what I know. Selfishness robs us of what we're truly supp supposed to experience in this life. But selflessness allows us to participate, allows our souls to be a part of what we were called and created to be. We are called to pour our lives into other people. We're called to make a difference. We're called to see life in other people. We are called to walk in our God-given design. And that only help happens when we pour our lives out, when we empty ourselves as disciples. Here's what I know. If you're taking notes, write this in your notes today. An empty vessel is the only vessel that God can fill. An empty vessel is the only vessel that God can fill. If you're full of yourself, how can God fill you with himself? If it's all about me, how can I allow God to pour his life into me? That we are called to see people the way God does. One of my favorite stories is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa's walking in India and, and we're in her missions field. And she's walking with these dignitaries, these really elite people. And all of a sudden, as they're walking, she's showing them their work. She goes, whoa, look, look, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And she takes off running. All of a sudden, the dignitaries get all excited, like, oh, Jesus? And they start running after her, right? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And she runs to this little homeless boy laying underneath a tree. She says, here's Jesus. And they kind of look a little stunned. And she goes, you don't see Jesus here? You don't see Jesus a part of this young man. 
And she's referencing basically what Jesus said to his disciples. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was, when I was cold, you, you gave me a coat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And the disciples go, Jesus, dude, I don't know what you talk about. We never did any of that. And she said, when you do this for one another, you're doing it to me. It reminds me of what 1 John 4, 12, my favorite verse says. No one's ever seen God, but when we love one another, he lives in us and is brought to full expression through us. That when we pour our lives, when we serve other people, when we allow ourselves to get above ourselves and our needs and our pride and our preferences and our ego, and we pour our lives, that's when we actually experience God in ways we could never fathom. That's when heaven collides with earth. That's when the presence of God sweeps us up. That's where revival is found. That's when an empty vessel is pouring their lives out to someone else so God can fill his life into us. An empty vessel cannot be filled with anything if you're filling it with yourself and not God. And so I want to talk about that today. And we're actually going to break down a story that Jesus teaches. It is so powerful and it is so beautiful. And it's this last meal he has with his disciples. It's the Passover meal. It's right before he's about to be arrested and he's about to lose his life on the cross. And he's having this meal and he shares this moment with the disciples and it's in our reading text. And it is this powerful illustration that he presents to them. So let's pick it up. It's in John. Watch this. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, watch this, God will bless you for doing them. That's a really important word. God will Bless you for what? Doing them. Here's what you got to get in your spirit, church. There is a difference between knowledge and application. There is a difference between knowing what you should do and doing what you should do. There's a difference between absorbing and hoarding and absorbing and pouring. There's a difference between being a smart Christian and an active disciple. There's a difference between walking in what you're called and created to be or just knowing what you're called and created to be. And God is calling us not to absorb the things of God, but pour the things into the world around us. He is calling us to live something more. And so today, I want to talk very quickly about what we learn from this example of Jesus. What we learn from this serving that Jesus teaches us to. So if you have your notes, pull them out, write this down. The first thing we learn is this. Serving starts with me. Serving starts with me. It doesn't start with anybody else. It starts with me. So let me set the context of this story really quickly with you. Jesus is having this meal at the Passover meal. It's the the last meal. But custom at this time is when someone would have a meal, they would have a host. And that host would come in, and that host would actually hire a servant that would wash every guest's feet as they walk in. Because back in them days, there was no roads that were paved. There was no nice concrete sidewalks. You didn't have closed toe shoes. You had these sandal type things. So every day you out there walking in dirt and mud and animal feces and whatever else junk you find on there. So when you come into someone's house, you feet's all kinds of nasty. So they got somebody there to wash that nasty feet because I don't want you tramping on my carpet, right? That's what happens. Guess what, though? They ain't got nobody hosting this party. The disciples are hosting it for themselves. So they're in this room, and they all looking at each other going, I ain't washing no feet. You should be washing some feet. I tell you my job. And they got this tension at this moment going on between the disciples. There's this jealousy. Some of the disciples right now are mad because some get to spend more time with Jesus. Another of them are angry because some of them want favoritism. A couple of the disciples had a mama. They they mama's boys go talk to Jesus. And then mama come up to them, Jesus. Hey, Jesus, 
When we get to heaven, can my boys sit by you? My, they good baby boys. Can they sit by you on the right side in heaven, right? What if Jesus said yes, right? You know these disciples are going to be fighting with each other. Who got to sit by Jesus? So you got this tension in the room. They all arguing. They jealous. They're wanting this favoritism and this tension. So they're looking at each other going, you should be the one to serve. Do you see all that I do? Do you see what I have to do? And it's this fight. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this tension, Jesus stands up. And Jesus walks to the disciples, pours a bowl of water, and starts swashing their feet. It's almost like he's making this declaration, it starts with me. Let me show you what we're called to be. Let me show you what we are meant to be. Paul says it like this in Timothy, watch this. He says, we are called to be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity that we are to be an example we are to call ourselves disciples and then live what a disciple should be we should show the world what love and service and action really is here's what i believe i believe selfishness is robbing the church of the fullness of their anointing and impact we get into this place where we want i want me mentality right i want it my way i want it to be about my needs i want my preferences i want it to be about my emotions i want it to be about my seat. I want to be about the music I like. I want it to be about how I want to feel and what I want. And we have this I want mentality that is robbing the impact of the church. And let me tell you something. It's not the mandate of the church. It's not what the Bible has called us to create it. It's not what the word of God is calling us and shaping us to be. Watch what Peter says. Peter says it like this. He goes, huh? God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you see that? He said he gives us gifts to serve one another. God doesn't give us gifts so we can accumulate more power and titles. God doesn't give us more gifts so we can walk in some prestige and get applause and get people to love us. God doesn't give us more gifts so that we can have preferential treatment and our preferences be made. He gives us gifts so we can serve one another, so we can be who God has called and created us to be, so we can be the hands, the feet, and the mouthpiece of Jesus. Church, can you dream with me for a second? Can you imagine what our world would look like if we got away from our preferences and started getting on the mission and the gospel of Jesus. Can you believe what our world would look like if we gave up something we love for something we love more, populating heaven and depopulating hell? Can you imagine what our world would look like if we cared not about our seat and our preferential service, but about souls being saved, families being redeemed, children going up passionate about Jesus? Can you imagine what it would look like if we lived to pour our lives, not to hoard and absorb? I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes today, but it's flipped season you probably need a pedicure anyway come on church we gonna get the step in amen we gotta be who God has called us to be and it starts with me the second thing we learn is this write this in your notes serving starts with the secret opportunities serving starts with the secret opportunities watch this Jesus models this in front of just a few people He doesn't model this on some big stage. He doesn't model this in front of thousands. He's in a small room, just a few bit of people in the secret. It's easy to serve when you get public recognition. It's easy to serve when all eyes are on you. It's easy to go out of your way when everybody sees you going out of your way. It's hard to do the right thing when no one watches you. And no one sees you. It's hard and it's a sacrifice to do the work when you feel like no one else is watching you. But we miss the greatest opportunities in life because we're waiting for the public recognition instead of the secret opportunities. Because it's in those moments that God shapes us. One of my favorite quotes is Joe Frazier. He says it like this. You can map out a fight plan or a life plan. But when the action starts, you're down to your reflexes. That's where your road work shows. If you cheated on that in the dark morning, you get found out now under the bright lights. You know what? Who you are when no one's watching 
will soon be who you are when all eyes are on you. And God has given you opportunities, and they may be secret. They may feel like nobody's seeing you right now. But let me tell you something. It's in those moments God's shaping you. Or maybe a better way to say it is this. Write this in your notes. How we live in our private times will determine the purity of who we are in our public times. How we live in our private times will determine the purity of who we are in our public times. See, I used to deal with this a lot. As a young believer, I used to think in the spotlight is where lives are changed. When, when I get to do it and everybody gets to see me, that's where the lives are changed. I didn't realize there's a spotlight on my heart that God is watching and he's developing. And what I do in those moments when no one else sees me but my God is shaping me and developing my impact to make a difference in this world. It may seem secret right now. You may feel like you're serving right now and no one else sees you, but I can promise you something. You're not in this alone. Your God sees you and he's moving in your heart and minds. He's developing you and equipping you to put you on a platform to give you an influence that's going to make hell quake and heaven rejoice because eternity is going to be impacted by the person you're called and created to be. Jesus said it like this. He says it like this. Watch this. For the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. God sees clearly what you're doing, and he's examining your path. It took me a long time to get this, right? I, I wanted to be the speaker, right? I wanted to give them goosebump moments. I wanted the platform. I wanted the big message. But I thought sometimes the things that were secret behind the scenes wasn't really that important. And I didn't realize it's those moments that God's shaping and moving and developing and growing. I didn't realize that moments missed are actually great opportunities that I'm missing. That when I have this conversation with someone one-on-one -on -one and I get to pour in their lives, when I send someone a car to make them special when I help a buddy move because they need help when I pick up the phone and answer that when I tell someone I'll buy you coffee let me take you to lunch I'm actually developing a relationship because I want to serve based on who I am not the applause I receive and that develops my character on my inside God can use someone with character God can use someone that's anointed to do the same in the darkness as they do on the bright lights of the stage. Here's what I know. Write this in your notes. God looks at our motives before he admires our actions. God looks at our motives. He looks at who you are as a person before he ever admires what you do as a human. Who you are in the darkness shapes who you will be in the light. I like this conversation. Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. But when you get to give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. God sees you. You may feel like no one else sees you. God sees you. He's rewarding you and developing you and equipping you. And it brings me to the third thing we learn is this. Serving starts with the insignificant areas everyone else ignores. Serving starts with the insignificant things that everyone else is ignoring. Think about this for Jesus. He's the Messiah. He is the savior of the world. He literally has healed people, saw blind people see, crippled people walk, deaf people hear. He fed 5,000. He rose people from the grave. He done the most miraculous things, yet in a small room, he drops to his knees and he starts washing the feet of his disciples. He starts washing mud and animal feces, and all the muck off of their feet. This is a man that's doing an act that you know is considered beneath him, that you know is like, man, he's too much of a dude to be doing something like this. He is the Messiah, he's the Savior, he's a prophet, he's done things we can never imagine. How is he doing something that's a servant's job, that's somebody that's a hired help's job? He's sitting and doing what no one else would do because he knew 
the characters in those insignificant moments that everyone else ignores. I love what Paul says in Galatians. Paul says it like this. He goes, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You're not that important, right? If you think you all that in a bag of chips, you realize that bag of chips is empty because you ain't that, right? Come on. You're just fooling yourself. And that's what happens. Sometimes we think we're too good to do something. Sometimes we think a job's beneath us. Sometimes we think we're too significant to do the insignificant things. Sometimes we've got in our minds what is our to-do list and what everybody else's to-do list is. And that stuff is not what we do at the caliber of person we are called to be. But Jesus models something different. And he shows us what we're called to be. He tells the disciples in Mark, he says, he says, if you want to be a leader, you must be a servant. Do you get that? Leaders are servants. The CEO of Chick-fil-A, Dan Cathy, has this great example. He says, I have the greatest leadership tool, and I take it with me everywhere I go. It's the greatest tool of leadership. He goes, every store I walk in, I bring it with me. And he says, what it is, is it's a Johnson and Murphy industrial strength shoe brush. And every store he walks into, he'll get one of the employees, one of the drive through workers, one of the cooks, and he'll set them in a chair. And in that moment, he'll get on his knees, and he'll start brushing their shoes. And then he'll start talking to them, looking up at them. And he'll ask them about their day. He'll ask them about their dreams. He'll ask them about their ambitions. He'll ask them about their wants. And what he says is, this so great about this brush, it works on all types of shoes. It works on everything. It works on all styles of shoes. It works on all types of people. Because no matter where you are and who you are, when you get down below and humble yourself to serve someone and actually care about someone and invest in someone, it shifts something in their lives. It changes something in their hearts and minds. And we miss it because we think things are insignificant. But what we don't realize is this. Great opportunities often disguise themselves in small tasks. Some of the greatest opportunities disguise themselves in the small tasks that most people don't ever notice. I tell this to our, our dream team. That's the people that serve here every week, week in and week out throughout the weeks. I say there is no small and significant task at our church. There is nothing that is meaningless. Did you know this? That people make an impression of our church, a first impression, within eight minutes of being in our church. And studies show that first impressions are the hardest impression to change. So people make an impression of our church before they've ever heard the worship, before they've ever heard me speak. They make an impression the moment they pull in the parking lot and what they experience out in the parking lot. They can make an impression when they walk over and check their children into the kids' facility. They make make an impression in our bathrooms. They make an impression when they receive a worship guide. They make an impression sitting in this room. And every single one of those reasons are creating something in their lives, whether it's dropping guards or raising guards. When they pull in our parking lot and they feel like nobody greets them or it's a ghost town, they're going to think, am I in the right place? Is this place a place that's welcoming? Should I even be here? When they go check their kids in in the ch kids facility and it feels sketchy or, or unclean or they feel turned off by the people working there all of a sudden the mom is thinking I don't know I don't know I don't know if my kids are safe I don't know if I want my kids being in there when they come in there and they see the bathrooms if they're trash they're gonna go they can't even take care of the bathrooms how can they take care of me and my family when they walk in here and they get worship guide materials and it looks like it's all discombobulated and has no meaning to it or they sitting in this room and they sit in here and no one talks to them they're gonna think this is a bunch of clicks and nobody really wants me to do life every single job we have a dream teamer does is creating the opportunity for people to encounter Jesus when we're greeting out there, when it's hot or raining. You don't realize it, but you're creating a system of honor that makes people feel like they belong. When you're cleaning the bathrooms, you're honoring everybody to show that we value them and we care about them. When you're checking in their children, you're letting them know, we're going to disciple and take care of your children. When you're folding worship guides, we're letting them know, we want you to belong.
belong. We want you to fit in. When you say hello to somebody sitting in this seat, you're telling them, we want you a part of our family. And then when we get to this moment when the Holy Spirit moves in their hearts and lives and they give their hearts to Jesus, your name is attached to that salvation. God's going to rejoice with you in all eternity because no job is insignificant. No job is small. When you're serving for eternity, you will always be remembered for every soul that was encountered you were part of. My name's not attached to every salvation. By myself, we're in this thing together. We're populating heaven together. It may seem insignificant on a Saturday, but I promise you when hands are raising on a Sunday, heaven is rejoicing, amen? And that leads me to the fourth point is this. Serving starts with understanding. It's the mission of Jesus. It wasn't a suggestion. It's the mission. See, Jesus says this, it's my last days. It's my last moments. Jesus understands that every encounter, every lesson is the last moment he gets to instill something in his disciples. And they're going to go and start the church. They're going to go build what he has started. They're going to spread the gospel. So what he's speaking into their lives, especially in these last days, are so vital to who we are as people and as believers. He made this comment in John chapter 15, just a few chapters later. He says, love each other. In the same way I have loved you, there is no greater love to lay down your life for one's friends. But notice this. He says, this is my commandment. He doesn't say this is my suggestion. He doesn't say it's a good idea. He says, let me tell you, it's my commandment. It's imperative that we understand this. Why? Because people see Jesus when our love goes beyond ourselves and is willing to serve the interest of others. That people actually encounter Jesus when they see Jesus in and through you. That lives are changed when you can say, I'm going to put my interest aside for the well-being of people that are far from him. That when we become a church, this is we exist for people that aren't even here yet. And we're anticipating more lives are going to be changed. That we get to see God move in ways we can never fathom. Why? Well, Jesus said in John 13, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world you're my disciples. Listen to me. A disciple is not known by their title, but their lifestyle. One carries a lot more weight. One seems a lot more authentic. And one can be the hands and feet of Jesus. People will know we are a gospel-centered church, not because what we just preach on the stage, but the words we preach, we also live off the stage. God's calling us to live a life bigger than that. So let me get you out of here with a take home very quickly. Because I have one question to ask you. Am I going to serve me or serve we? Am I getting to the place where I just want to serve me, me, myself, and I? Or am I going to serve the collective good as a body of Christ has called us to? Paul says it like this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Here's the kicker. I can't decide for you. I can't talk you into it. I can't twist your arm. And God's not going to decide for you. He's not going to force you to do anything. The choice is yours. And you've got to get to this point where you want to intentionally share your life. you got to get to this point where you say, God, I want to intentionally share my time. I want to give my time. I want to pour myself into people, not things. God, I want to intentionally share my talents, that you've given me gifts to serve others well. And I want to serve others well. God, I want to intentionally share my treasure. I don't want to invest in things that fade away. I want to invest in the greatest investment, the kingdom of God, eternity. And lastly, I want to share my testimony. I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to point them to you. 
I want to invite them to church. I want to tell them what God's done in my life. I want people to know the hope of the world that is only found in you. I want to end with this quote that Pastor Chris Hodges says. To serve someone here on earth and not point them to Jesus is like inviting someone to heaven and not telling them how to get there. That would be cruel. To just being a good person but not seeing their eternity changed is missing it. We should desire for lives to be changed forever, not just in the temporary. And here's what I know. Jesus modeled serving like no one other else could. And Jesus went out of his way to serve you. He gave his life for you so that you could live. He bore the weight of sin so you didn't have to anymore. And he shed his blood so you could ask for his forgiveness and he would wash you clean. And right now, he wants to serve you and see you redeemed and restored right now. And if you're in this room right now and you've never given your heart to Jesus, maybe you say, Pastor Mike, I'm new to this whole church business. I don't know, really know what the Bible says that much. I'm very prayed but I feel something in my heart and I'm ready for my life to be changed. Or maybe you have in the past, but you've walked away. And God is calling you right now to come back home. And you feel like it's time to turn from this life that is walking away from God and start going back to your eternal purpose as a child of God. Well, it's very simple. All you have to do, the Bible says, is confess with your mouth. Say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. I need you to move in ways I can never fathom. Forgive me. And then believe in your heart he hears your prayers. Why? Because he died and rose from the grave. And he is sitting in heaven right now listening to your prayers and ready to respond. So if you're in this room right now, no more settling and no more running away from your God. It's time to come home. So I want everybody in this room right now, bow your heads. Nobody looking around. Take your hand and place it on your heart. It's a symbol of your soul. And I want everybody in this room to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. And I believe your blood washes away all sins. I have many sins, but you forgive them all. And today, I commit my life to you. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I and I am so incredibly glad you joined us online today. If you made that commitment to Jesus for the first time, or maybe you recommitted your life to Jesus, we would love to hear from you and celebrate with you. If you could just email us at connect at bloomhere.org or leave a comment below, we would love to share this moment with you. If you've been blessed by today and God really just spoke to you and you want to take that next step to financially contribute to our church, we would love for you to help fuel the ministry. And all you can do is go to bloomhere.org slash give. You can give a one-time gift or set up reoccurring giving like I do. Make sure your tithe and offering always comes first. But we want to continue to fuel the work in the ministry as we want to see more lives change, more people growing up passionate about Jesus and seeing families redeemed and restored. If you'd also like to connect with us on any social media platform, you can do that at Church Bloom on all Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Guys, I cannot wait to see you next week. And if you're ever in the Branson area, we'd love for you to join us live at one of our five Sunday services. Love you guys. Pray God. Peace.